Thank you for coming. Hi. Um, so I stare a lot at mempool graphs and at unspent sets and when stuff goes wrong for our customers, when transactions get stuck and that like. And maybe after this talk, you don't have to do as much of that as I did. And also, this was a bit of a collaboration. I had help from some colleagues and other people that contributed. So here's the alternative title of my talk. <laughs> All right. Um, so really, unspent selection or UTXO management is about what do you do in order to save money creating outputs, right? Because when you send money, you want to, to create recipient outputs, and that's the prime goal. All the rest of it is just overhead. And um, so we have a lot of those UTXOs floating about. Um, why should we be managing that? I want to motivate that a little bit. Um, you might have seen a graph like this before. Uh, this is a very popular mempool graph. Uh, on the x-axis, we have the time. This is now showing January 2017 through today. And um, on the y-axis, you see the amount of data waiting in the queue to be included in the blockchain. Now you ask, what, what are the colors about? Well, uh, the color bands in this graph are fee rates. Blue is low fee rates of one Satoshi per byte, the min fee rate, uh, up to about 10 Satoshis per byte, and then green is about until 40 Satoshi, and yellow is about until 140 Satoshis per byte. Now, what really stands out here is this huge spike in the middle at um, the winter 2017 through January 2018, and um, I want to talk a little more about that, but I also want to point out, so we had a huge fee spike in end of 2017, and then we had a little more activity lately in the past three months or so, and this is part of the motivation why I'm speaking here today, because I want people to be able to prepare for the next fee event. So let's look a little closer at the fee event in winter 2017 and 18. You might see that the colors are a lot more squashed down here now. And this is because we're now looking at a node that was run with the default mempool. The previous graph had all transactions. This one has only what fits into the default mempool of 300 megabytes. 300 megabytes of data roughly translate to about 140 megabytes of serialized data. And um, what happens when the mempool gets full is that the higher fee transactions supplant transactions that have low fees. So if you see, for example, above this December 24, there's this huge red um, spike downwards. This is high fee transactions pushing out everything below 100 Satoshis per byte. That's 100 times the min fee rate to send a transaction on the Bitcoin network. Everything not paying more than 100 times the min fee rate was just kicked out of nodes mempools. Uh, you might notice that I always say the mempool. This is because while every full node maintains their own view of the mempool, this is generally so homogenous across all nodes that you can say the mempool as if everybody mostly sees the same thing, as long as they use the same uh, sizes, of course. So high fee rate transactions kick out low fee transactions. And uh, we saw actually right around Christmas Eve that fee rates went up to oh, above a thousand satoshis per byte. And then um, some transactions, if you see the, the bottom left corner, there's a lot of blue there. All these transactions waited in the mempool up to two months to be confirmed. Now, usually the mempool clears at least once per week, often once per day, where there's just a few blocks that are empty and it clears down to one satoshi per byte. But here, the mempool was so congested that some transactions were stuck in, in waiting for two months. And this gets a little more funny even. At the end of the period, when uh, the higher fee transactions got um, confirmed slowly, some people that had kept more of the whole blockchain 
started resubmitting the low fee transactions. So even though the fees had gone down to almost 40 satoshis per byte at the top right corner where it becomes green again, it's still a full mempool. And then slowly all the transactions down to one satoshi per byte got re-added. And this was a bit of a problem actually because some people uh, consider transactions that haven't gotten confirmed for weeks uh, as dropped and no longer um, in queue. For example, I believe Bitcoin Core drops transactions after about two weeks or so, stops resubmitting them. And um, now suddenly somebody put in all these old transactions and transactions don't get invalid just because they, they got lost out of the mempool. Somebody signed a valid, valid payment instruction to the network, said these inputs get spent and uh, these outputs get created. And then as long as that data is not invalidated by spending the unspent in a different way, this remains a valid transaction. So at the, at the end of this period, suddenly we had a bunch of transactions people weren't even tracking anymore uh, come back to live and be confirmed. And a lot of people that had, for example, just redone that payment already, paid double that way. <clears throat> um, so this was a bit of a painful episode. Uh, also for another reason, because some wallets, had, or most wallets, were utterly unprepared for this. The, the whole price movement that went up to 20k uh, caused so much transaction frenzy over trading and, and that um, uh, fees went up so high that a lot of unspends, as in pieces of Bitcoin, were unspendable because the fees you had to pay to include them in a transaction were actually more than the value of the unspends. Uh, the most mind-blowing example of that is I saw a wallet uh, in December 2017 that had over 500,000 unspends that had 10,000 10, satoshis or less, uh, which were about by a factor of 10 unspendable. And uh, if you consider that the whole mempool only had 64 million unspends, this was about 1% of all unspends in that uh, time and they couldn't spend any of them because they couldn't pay to get them included without paying extra. So this wallet in particular waited until everything went down to min fee rate and then they consolidated. And one Satoshi made a difference of 28%, uh, sorry, 2.8% or 1.4% fees on, on these uh, inputs. So. For them, it was worth waiting. Patience is a superpower. I'll get to that back later as well. So um, we had this huge fee spike, end of 2017, early 2018, and it coincides with the highest UTXO set count we ever had as well, which was about 64 million unspent. And then after that, people woke up a little bit and started consolidating their wallets better, better preparing uh, for other such events. but. Um, I think we're actually very close to 60 million. We're, like today it was 59.6 million unspent in the pool. And this is a little bit um, worrisome because uh, on, on the top of this peak, it was about 0.26 Bitcoin per UTXO in average. And last month it was 0.31 Bitcoin per UTXO. And now we're back to 0 0.30 Bitcoin per UTXO. So we're getting back down to smaller and smaller <coughs> unspends. In fact, if you look at a uh, graph, how many outputs we create in comparison to, to inputs we consume, we create about 17.7% more outputs than we consume inputs. And alone in the last month, we've created 3.6 million extra UTXOs. So if we create the same number, we're gonna be above what we had in the uh, 2017 spike uh, in about a little more than a month. Luckily, we have a little more block weight now to, to get transactions included, but, um, oh, and also, I'm not entirely sure if that's just because people forgot how to consolidate or are getting a little, new, new entrants don't have, don't have the experience of that fee spike, or if it's just so much more people joining Bitcoin that each hold some unspends and um, just by breadth of more people, uh, the unspent count got increased that way. Well, anyway, 
So I think that uh, we should start caring about unspents and the question is perhaps when should we get started and I hope you can read this. This is uh, 16 blogs I picked on Friday evening from blockchain.com and I, uh, on, on those 16 um, blocks there was room for consolidations. Eight of these blocks were not full. So uh, 4, 000, uh, 4 million weight units would be a full block. You see that uh, there's a bunch of 3,900 plus, but there is also about eight blocks that would have had space for uh, more transactions to be included. So um, what I'd like you to consider is not all transactions have to be in the next block, right? Yes. Can we ask questions? Yes. Can you? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, hello, hello. Yeah. Can you explain that again? Con why is consolidation connected with blocks that aren't full? What's happening in a consolidation? Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll cover consolidations in depth a little more later, but generally the idea is you want to create um, higher fee, sorry, higher value unspent and fewer of them because they'll be spendable at high fee rates. Um, what consolidations in, in, and empty blocks have to do with each other is um, if you create a consolidation transaction, it will probably use a lot of inputs and create few outputs. Inputs are bigger than outputs, so um, consolidation transactions tend to be rather massive in size, or I mean you can create smaller ones too, but the efficiency of the process is higher the more inputs you use. And here in these blocks that I'm showing, for example, the top three um, have about 25% or less full in some. So there would have been space for a lot of consolidation transactions. Sure. Any more questions? Oh, okay. All right. So, um, do you know? Do we also know? Do we know the, uh, what the mempool was looking like during those consolidation or possible consolidation periods? Meaning like, were those uh, marginally full blocks, marginally full because there just wasn't anything in the mempool or was it just miners were choosing not to include? So uh, if you look at the timestamps on the top three, they're apart by, uh, so there was a block at 10 past eight, 11 past eight, 14 past eight, 17 past eight. So there was four blocks found in roughly eight minutes. That always helps. And, and then uh, the mempool was actually empty at that point. Uh, over, over the weekend, uh, the past three weekends actually, we had multiple periods of times where the long-term fee estimate or the next block fee estimate uh, of Bitcoin Core dropped to one Satoshi provide. And um, those are the golden times to consolidate because you'll never, or until we get a lower min fee rate, you'll never get an option to, to consolidate for less money. And, um, what we really want is uh, what I'm talking about in the next slide. <laughs> so, um, as you can see here, this is not the same day, but um, a similar situation. Um, this is Friday evening sharp. You, you get this huge drop where less transactions get added to the queue, more there's maybe a flurry of fast blocks, and suddenly the mempool is empty. And um, so you might be wondering, we still have a throff of, of transactions with 40 to 100 Satoshis per byte on top of the mempool here for a long period of that day. Um, and the problem that users are solving here is um, they're trying to shoot once and hit an intended block target. And they cannot predict exactly how quickly the next few blocks are going to come because it's a Poisson process and you cannot know until the block is found. Um, the, the bumping mechanisms are somewhat cumbersome. CPFP requires you to add additional fees um, and create another transaction, hence bloating the um, mempool even more. RBF has issues with implementation such that it causes you to change the TX ID of the transaction that you're following. And a lot of people are making broad assumptions about TX ID is remaining constant for tracking. So that's not easy. So most people just tend to overshoot and use a higher fee than they would maybe need to to get included. But that way they ensure that 
whoever is on the recipient side receives their funds rather quickly. So you you get about this um, <laughs> you get a, the situation where somebody here added about one megabyte of transactions at one satoshi per byte, even though there was uh, about 10 megabytes of transactions waiting at that time. Yet, seven hours later, they, um, they got confirmed and they had their, their funds back in the form of a one larger unspent, presumably, if this was a consolidation. So, really a superpower, uh, sorry, patience is a superpower in the sense that if you are willing to, to signal a low time preference and wait for it, you can still get consolidations through. It might take a while, maybe 14 days, whatever, but you're, you're just spending unspent that, or UTXOs that you're not using right now anyway, small ones, and you're creating a transaction that, that is not of important um, urgency. So, yes? So essentially they were spending half in mining fees when they got it? Yes, they, well, no, they're paying min fee rate. So one Satoshi per bet. And here at the top, the yellow lines are about 100 yeah. satoshis per byte. So, talking the next one, the next step is like two, is like twice. Uh, yeah, exactly. The the next blue band would be two satoshis, uh, two to three satoshis per byte. Uh, you mentioned a uh, lower fee rate than one satoshi per byte. How are we going into like fractional? There was this, a proposal last year to lower the min fee rate to, I think, uh, 0.2 satoshis per byte, but it didn't get a lot of love yet. Uh, strictly speaking, if you only have to, to, to add a fee rate, um, sorry, to add fees to a transaction, you make a difference between the inputs and the output amount, right? So you assign less to the outputs than you uh, consumed in the inputs. And whatever the difference, miners can collect in the Coinbase transaction, right? So the smallest fee that you can give is one Satoshi, because that's a difference that is not zero. And then if you make a large transaction, you could have fractional uh, fee rates. Yes. Can you give zero? You could, yes. We, we Originally, that, that was definitely a possibility, but it's just... Uh, now, non I think... It's not related. Uh, they don't get relayed because they're non-standard if they pay less than the min fee rate, I think. But that was not originally the case. Core, core one. Core, uh, core one, yeah. Other, other clients I, do. I've, <laughs> I've, had, I've had coins confirm that they've been less than the min fee rate. So. Yeah. Just, you're not going to get relayed by core, so. All right. So you said that this guy's fee rate, or because he paid a low fee rate, eventually he waited and, and the mempool went down. What causes that? Like, why does it change over time? What happens? Is it during the night when people are sleeping, but thought Bitcoin was global? What's going on? Yeah, so uh, we definitely see a, a cyclic behavior in the mempool. So, for example, we see that about at 6 a.m. every morning, there's some big entity that dumps a megabyte or five into the mempool every morning at 6 a.m. sharp, but only business days. There is, um, there is a lot, definitely an uptake um, between like the New York business hours starting at like 9 a.m. New York. And Friday, this, this cut off here is Friday evening here, uh, I think about 9 p.m. Pacific. And suddenly there is just significantly less transactions being added to the mempool. And so you have a weekly cycle, you have a daily cycle, uh, it gets overlaid by trading activity, which usually drives more transactions and um, price action generally. Um, yeah. And then it's very random, depending on how quickly blocks are found and, I don't know, uh, whether it's rainy and more people are at home, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, so, motivation is we would like to be better prepared for the next fee event, we would like to have spendable unspends, and uh, how can we achieve them, right? So I, I generally stretched my ideas for how you could interact with your UTXO pool into two blocks. One is shaping your composition of your UTXO pool, and I'm going to try to say UTXO pool for your wallet's UTXOs, and UTXO set for the global UTXO set that is all of Bitcoin. And if I say unspent, I also mean UTXOs, just so you know. 
Um, the first one would be shaping your UTX output. And I want to get into consolidations a little more here. Uh, what, um, so maybe also for, for understanding, BitGo is a um, wallet service provider for enterprise customers, and some of the wallets we look at are fairly big, and some of these things don't directly translate to private wallets that might have half a dozen unspends, but we're looking at transaction or wallets that have transactions in the hundreds per day, maybe, right? So um, what you want to do is you want to figure out how many unspends you need to have in your wallet in order to operate smoothly. Uh, you want to have enough that you do not run out of funds when there's a spike of activity and you have to send out more. You want to have little enough that you're not wasting fees by, by um, creating large transactions at high fees. So what you try to do is you pick some UTXO pool size, maybe a thousand unspents or so, and then if you exceed that, you pick a metric by which you decide which uh, UTXOs get consolidated. For example, any UTXOs that are older than three months, or any UTXOs that are smaller than 10,000 Satoshis, or UTXOs that are use an inefficient address format, like um, something that isn't segwit yet. And then you just shoot off a transaction at the lowest possible fee rate and wait. What you don't want to do is, you definitely don't want to use an unconfirmed consolidation output for an input in a transaction. So some wallet implementations, when they run out of unconfirmed funds, yeah, sorry, confirmed funds, they will um, fall back to using unconfirmed. And, I'm sorry. And, and the problem with that is, um, so I was on, on call uh, Christmas 2017, in the midst of this, High fee spike, and uh, one of our customers had gotten had done consolidations uh, before the huge fee spike, and um, in the midst of it, when it went to a thousand satoshis per byte, they actually ran out of confirmed funds, and the unspent selection picked up a consolidation output for a transaction with 200 inputs, roughly 0.30 kilobytes or so, and um, they sent a transaction off that was worth 20 million US dollars of, of that. So it was a bit in a pickle because everybody else was celebrating Christmas and uh, we worked together for a few hours to build a manual CPFT transaction because we didn't have CPFT back then. And um, then bumped a transaction worth 20 million US dollars and Christmas Eve. <laughs> so please don't use unconfirmed consolidation outputs for inputs. Don't use all your funds in consolidations because then you'll run out of confirmed funds quicker. Use a small portion, maybe 1% of your total value in the, in the wallet, right? And then the result will be a lot of small unspends will become large unspends and very few of them. And that's what you want to do with consolidations. So what is also useful is if you don't have all the same size in your wallet. Uh, for example, the old Bitcoin Core uh, coin selection algorithm would try to always create change outputs of exactly 0 0.01 uh, Bitcoin, if I remember correctly, right? So now you have a lot of unspends that are exactly the same size, and what does that do to the com combination space of your um, UTX pool, right? If you have two unspends that are both three Bitcoin, you can combine either three Bitcoin or six Bitcoin in, in inputs, if you have instead three inputs that are three, two, and one Bitcoin, you get a lot more combinations. And this translates, of course, to a larger UTXO pool. So if you have magnitudes of different unspends, you'll get um, a lot more options and what combinations to use for your input set. If all your unspends are the same size, not so much. Uh, that's one, one reason not to over-consolidate, right? You want to have a certain amount of unspends. If you're creating a lot of transactions, that'll help you make better transactions. Uh, small unspends can be useful, for example, to create exact matches, where the input set provides exactly as much value as you want to create in the recipient outputs. And you don't have to create a change output. And not creating change output is actually great. I'll get, talk about that more later. And <clears throat> 
So here's another example. Um, I'm, I'm going to introduce two wallets later that we can look at a little bit. And one of them has 20k unspends about. And they only have 100 unspends greater than 0.1 Bitcoin, but 95% of the value in those 100 biggest unspends. So they have a very broad uh, range of, of unspends across many magnitudes, and that makes them actually able to create great transactions, TSTs. All right. Um, the third part of how to shape your unspend pool is, let's say you start a new wallet and it's empty, but you start immediately with creating a bunch of um, transactions. And, and there's no block found yet. Uh, you, you send three times one Bitcoin, right? So you start out with 50 Bitcoin, you send one Bitcoin, and you get a change output of 49 Bitcoin, one change output. It's unconfirmed, but you spend it again in order to send one Bitcoin to a second address, and you get back a change output of 48 Bitcoin. And you do that again. And now, A, every transaction puts your full wallet's value into the flight, and it's unconfirmed. If you want to, for example, create another transaction that is of higher urgency than these, you cannot create that easily because you, you're essentially doing a child pays for a parent on the previous transaction and you have to pay for that one too. Of course, you could just go ahead and split those unspends differently in the change. You don't have to only create one change output. So especially if you're starting a new wallet, you might decide to uh, split those 49 Bitcoin you're getting back into two change outputs, 21 and 28. Note that I'm using two different amounts to, to give us more options in the amount variance. Um, then in the second transaction, one of those two unspends gets used. It's still unconfirmed, of course, because no block was used, uh, sorry, was found. And uh, you create more smaller unspends. And in the third one, you already have four unspends. And that's just by splitting change into two change outputs instead of a single one. So one of the things that people bump into that start a high volume wallet and just put a single uh, UTXO into it is there's a limit on the number of unconfirmed transactions that may chain to get together in the mempool. When you have more than 25 transactions that are unconfirmed, other nodes will not accept another transaction that builds on to that same transaction tree. So by splitting out the, the unspends quickly, and distributing the value across um, different um, chain QTXOs, you, you make this transaction graph much more distributed quickly as the first ones of those get confirmed. You also don't put your full wallet into flight every time you send a transaction. Why is there that one? Um, so, you have an idea? What was the question? Why is there the limit of the number of in-flight unconfirmed so you can have change? Com computational complexity in, in the mempool. If there are... So uh, Peter says computational complexity in the mempool. Um, so what Bitcoin Core does when it builds a block template is it will consider a transaction with the context of all of its predecessors. Is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so this... CPFP. Yeah, exactly. Child pays for parent. So when you um, create a transaction that builds on top of an unconfirmed transaction and has a very high fee, it will be considered with its ancestors in, as a package. Because it cannot get confirmed un unless its ancestors get confirmed. But on the other hand, the ancestors paid a lower fee. And uh, Bitcoin Core searches these transaction graphs for all transactions that it evaluates for inclusion in block templates. and um, yeah, that, that's sort of uh, computational effort, I guess. Thanks, Peter. All right, um, what you don't want to do is, uh, sorry, two more points on this slide. Um, you, so when you start a new wallet, some people just actively fan out the unspends already, uh, just to get, give it a head start. Uh, the other thing that you can do is just do an automatic splitting every time that you create large amounts. So say if a change output would put back 5% of your wallet's value into a single change output, you might want to split that into multiple. Or if, um, if you're below the count that you determined to be a good amount of unspends in your wallet, 
you might be splitting uh, large pieces of change. Don't over split though, because if you have to recombine two inputs in the next transaction that you just split, you're paying double for no reason, right? So it's, it's a bit of a, um, yes? How do you set those values? How do you set those values? I, I, I have also a bias in my, um, my question. Mostly gut feeling still, but uh, so. <laughs> I was making people not sure, honestly. Right. Um, what? I mean. For the amounts of the change, if what? Fibonacci is a good uh, way of summing together Mm -hmm. that can create a so, so early on we had a pretty high default, but most people were doing a single sense, and that was before the 2017 fee hike where a lot of people started batching and doing other more efficient ways of transaction building. And, and now we're lowering it to a much lower default UTXO account in the wallet, because people are, well, I'm, I'm actually, Stepping ahead in my talk a little bit, but um, basically the idea is if you do batching, you can have a very regular cadence of transactions, and you have less problems with running out of confirmed funds. So you need a lot fewer if you do so. Uh, well, we covered that. More questions? This is about shaping the UTXO pool of your wallet. Why is it better to spend? Um, the question is, why is it better to spend old UTXOs? Um, so, by spending old UTXOs, you make sure that your whole wallet cycles. Uh, but other than that, um, you should only distinguish unconfirmed and confirmed, uh, maybe. Of course, if you, say, were to spend newest first, you bump into a lot of unconfirmed unspends. But, um, you might be also revealing a little bit what your frequency of receiving funds is if you do newest spend. By oldest, you might reveal how old your oldest unspends are, and people might be able to guess by size and uh, uh, spacing of those unspends, how much you have in your wallet. But, so my, perf my personal um, recommendation is just do random on your set you'll get a similar expectation as oldest first, but it, you might reveal less about your wallet's content. Is there any good data about how, like the distribution of UTXOs, is it, you know, that, like I'm basically thinking that like there's, there's gonna be a diff different distribution between like uh, certain addresses, like has anybody done like in-depth analysis of like, okay, this is yeah. char that yeah. characterizes these. So um, you can find a bunch of that sort of data on pay2scripthash.org or yeah. something, um, uh, p2sh.org. Um, and I think there is a graph by Blockchain Capital or so that uh, looks at HODL waves. So yeah. that there's some, I think I haven't seen a graph that categorizes size of unspent with, with age, but you, you could just generate or like use coin metrics to generate one or something like that. And what you definitely see is that people that use batching are correlated with newer address formats and consolidations, that sort of thing. For example, when you have a fee congestion and there's a bunch of consolidation transactions waiting that get cleared up when the mempool empties, you see that blocks get a lot bigger because there's a lot of segment transactions uh, consolidations at the bottom of the, the um, mempool. Um, so I think it, it basically what it shows is that people that adopt um, uh, protocol updates quickly also make use of other impro efficiency improvements earlier. So is, I would imagine, is, is it not the case that uh, a hot wallet's uh, UTXO design is going to be really dependent on that customer's needs and like what their user's behaviors are. And, you know, I would imagine that you might design, you know, you know, like UTXOs and powers and then being able to quickly match them, but I would guess that would be really, really dependent on like your users. And just... Yeah, also, the, funnily enough, even if you know perfectly well how much money people are, say, say you have a bunch of customers that withdraw 100 bucks every Friday or something, 
uh, you don't know what the price of Bitcoin will be the next Friday. So matching the UTXO size to, to the future need, uh, it has so many different dimensions that it's really difficult to predict. I think what works pretty well is just to have a very good distribution to try not to over split or over consolidate. And then, I mean, you, you just need a certain amount of, of unspent is roughly what I'm saying. And then what comes next? <laughs> Question. Yeah. Is there a threshold for what is considered over splitting or over consolidating? Um, what percentage of your UTXO should be on the side? It's, it's very pattern dependent on what your wallet does. If you have a send only wallet, over splitting could mean that you have more than 300 unspends. If you have a send and receive wallet, you, you might be good in the thousands of unspends. If you're using a personal wallet, you probably don't want, need a 100 UTXO set um, for your one cent a month. Um, maybe for privacy reasons, but then you should do uh, picking your own coin selection, sort of manual coin control. Thank you. Uh, so is there any, yeah. is there any software which does automatic consolidation today? Or do you have to like manually sit and figure out what do you have to do? Um, I think the problem with that is that any software that does automatic stuff for you means it can sign for your transactions. And I think that's why people are apprehensive. But really, if you use some sort of interface or wallet, uh, you can just have a cron job run that checks whether your metrics are met and then creates a consolidation transaction. Sorry, what? Um, I'm not aware of one, but there might well be some Bitcoin exchanges or so that, that have that sort of protocol running. Actually, I'm pretty sure that some of them do, um, but just for their individual use. All right, then I want to get into optimizing blockchain space uh, use, block space use. So. Um, I, I think that you probably have heard all of these before and um, I'm gonna try to go through quickly, but there's, you might be interested in a few of the, the takes I have on them. So, batching. You might have seen Dave Harding's great write-up on what batching can do for you. The general idea is just you, you collect multiple recipient outputs before you create a transaction. And what this does for you is you don't have to create a change output for every send that you do. If you do a single send, unless you find an exactly matching input set, you'll always create a change output back to yourself. And that's painful to, for twofold reasons. One, you pay for the change output on every transaction. Two, you have to spend that as an input later again. And it might be at high fees or just generally an additional block space use that you didn't have to make. So if you, for example, combine 10 cents in a single batching transaction, you'll save nine change outputs because you only send the rest back in a single change output. And you might also save some inputs because you don't have to overshoot as much. When you create change outputs, you inherently need to select more than what is necessary to create the payload. If you batch them together, you will be able to use fewer inputs in combination and create fewer exchange outputs. And then, uh, this is more something that affects big wallets as well. Uh, if you do batching, you have more UTXOs to pick from to build your transaction. And the chances to create an exactly matching input set where you don't even have to create any change output becomes higher. Um, one of the things that I mentioned before was some wallets with very high volumes and spikiness in user behavior would run out of confirmed funds. And by doing batching transactions, you can control very easily what sort of cadence of transactions you create. And this is actually one of the biggest benefits that people see in batching is that it smooths the wallet operation a lot. They just, for example, create one transaction per minute or one transaction in 15 minutes. And until then, they just tell their user your deposit uh, withdrawal is being processed, and then they create one transaction that pays 30, 50 people. And uh, this, this makes it much easier to manage your UTXO pool. One uh, downside that Harding describes in his uh, 
blog post is that it reduces the privacy potentially. But really, what can you tell? Well, you got a withdrawal from some Bitcoin exchange, and probably a lot of the other outputs were also a withdrawal from that. But that's basically it. And if it doesn't have a change output, nothing ties back to the Bitcoin exchange. So I don't know. We will have to ask a chain analysis com company or uh, some privacy experts on that. Yes, Alex. And you can tell that if there's a frequency with which your uh, your output was included in the transaction, you know that that happened at like time zero, and then five minutes later, five minutes later, mm -hmm. suddenly you know all those other ones are from whatever exchange you used. So you're saying just because there's a transaction every five minutes, you assume that this must be whatever. And that it lines up with the one you sent out. Lines up in what way? Um, same interval. All right, yeah. People should be classifying these, yeah. <laughs> Okay, all right. Um, this one's pretty big. That was one of the results of my master thesis on coin selection uh, a couple of years, three? Three years ago? Yeah. <laughs> so um, if you don't create change outputs, that's actually taking a lot of different dimensions of coin selection. A transaction is smaller. You save um, some 32, 34 bytes that you don't even have to write to the blockchain in order to send money back to yourself. Uh, it makes your UTXO pool smaller by not creating another change output in your wallet. And it increases your privacy because then there is no output back to your wallet that ties new transactions to this transaction. And you have zero unconfirmed funds in flight. So what you would want to do is, if you have a set of one, two, two, and four in your UTXO pool, um, you have, and you want to send three bitcoins, you would pick the set with one and two here because it doesn't create a change output. Um, there's, yeah, I'll, I'll get on that. You had a question? Okay. Uh, so how often does this happen given that you have to like assume that both the value and the fees are included and that sums up correctly? Well, in my master thesis, where I was doing a lot of theoretical work, I got a result with which I was very excited. It was 39%. For the actual values we achieve, I'll tell you in a few slides. <laughs> All right, um, the other part of this is you want to do fee-sensitive coin selection. So if you're creating a transaction at very high fees, you want to optimize for the transaction size. You want to create a transaction that is as small as possible. If you're creating a transaction at low fees, you might want to actually include more inputs in order to consolidate a little bit and to, to spend those nasty non-segwit outputs at low fees where they're, because they're more expensive and bigger, or that sort of thing. So here in this case, we have the same in UTXO set as before, uh, UTXO pool, sorry. And you want to send three Bitcoins. So if the fee is high, you might use the, the single four Bitcoin input and send one unspent back to yourself because the input is 148 bytes, the outputs are 34 bytes and pay to public key hash. So here you pay 148 bytes for the input and the 32 for the change is less than two inputs for 148 each, right? Of course, there's, there's a little more complexity because of fees here, but we'll, we'll gloss over that here, right? Uh, the other thing that you do here is, of course, address format preference. So if you spend at low fees, you want to include the big unspends, as in the, the heavy, more data unspends. At high fees, you might use native segwit unspends, which are much cheaper. So um, you were asking how often this happens. Well, we use something called the branch and bound coin selection algorithm to make that happen more often. It's a methodology to search deterministically through the combination set that you can uh, create from your unspends to try all potential input sets. And um, I described, a, well, an early version of that in my master thesis a couple of years ago. And then the idea here is it always finds an input set that doesn't need a change output. And um, 
since that cannot always happen, if you have, for example, a small UTXO pool, you will have very few possible combinations and you might not find one, you need a backup way to select your input set. So this does not work always, but often enough. The idea here is, as long as you create, pay less extra, drop, drop to feed some excess that is less than the cost of a change output, you're still saving money, right? If you have to pay for 32 bytes to create a change output, you haven't sent anything back to yourself yet. But 32 bytes at 100 Satoshis per byte are 3,200 Satoshis. So if I find a solution that is in the input set close enough to the target of my, my um, payload, then say I, I drop 1,000 Satoshis to the fee because I just don't match perfectly, then I'm still saving 2,200 Satoshis for the wallet. Right? So the idea is here, just find a solution that is in the target space. And then we later tuned this, uh, Peter helped me with that idea, or he had the idea. We introduced a waste metric, where you have basically a fitness function for the solutions here. And if you, um, with this fitness function, you can compare many different solutions, you can run multiple different coin selection algorithms, and pick the one that is the least wasteful. So for example, at high fees, this would pick a smaller input set and a change output. At low fees, it would pick the largest input set because at 2.4 Satoshi's per byte, you actually want to consolidate. So then here's a small look at how the branch and bound algorithm does. Uh, Casey. Just a real quick about the um, fitness function. Does it take into account the um, decreased expected confirmation time by a, by a transaction that pays more fees because it uh, is avoiding creating a change output? No, but that's sort of a, like a nice little side effect because you can't see PFP transactions that don't have change outputs. Cannot, right? Yeah, so in order to create a child pays for a parent to bump a transaction, you have to have a change output. So having a little more fees is actually pretty nice just because you overshot a little bit what, what you were aiming for. But uh, that's, that's actually sometimes a little bit of a problem that you can't bump these, unless you use RBF. <clears throat> um, or the recipient bumps. Or the recipient bumps, exactly. Well, why would you care? You don't have any funds coming back to yourself. <laughs> 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 All right, um, branch and bound. Um, this is an example from my master thesis. I um, had a UTXO pool of three unspents. The unspents are 0.1 Bitcoin, 0.09 Bitcoin, and point, sorry, that should be 0.05 Bitcoin. And what we're trying to select for is 0.14 Bitcoin. And uh, what, what the algorithm does is it basically builds all possible combination sets by first including the largest, then the second largest, third largest, and so forth. When it overshoots the target, it omits the one that it just tried, backtracks one up in the, in the tree, and tries the omission branch, branch instead. So if we're starting at the start on the left side, and we first uh, reach the decision of whether or not to include the 0.1 Bitcoin, we first go upwards, include the 0.1 Bitcoin, now we have Point one selected, that's less than what we're aiming for, so we continue. We include the 0 0.09 Bitcoin, that's overshot. So we cut that branch. We, have, we will not find any solutions in that subtree. We backtrack and we not include the 0 0.9 Bitcoin. Then we include the 0.5, we overshot, but it's a leaf, so we backtrack. And uh, the other branch would not give us enough funds, so that's also not a solution. All right. Do you always go through the... Thank you. When uh, picking which unspends to consider, do you always go through the entire unspend set, or do you just uh, start with the smallest one that is greater than your target amount and go downwards from there? Is that a leading question? <laughs> um, so it turns out that this is computationally intensive, of course, um, because uh, binary trees grow pretty quickly. and. Um, Looking at wallets that have 20k or more on spends, you might not want to build a binary tree of all of them. We actually, yes, pick a small subset. I actually just uh, finished work on that a few weeks ago where we implemented a new pre-selection, which, uh, yeah, 
which does that better. <laughs> it, it, it selects a broad variety instead of just um, well, the other method that we use. So yeah, we, we run this on a subset of all instruments, and um, that makes it a little better. We also just uh, stop this algorithm if it, after a fixed number of, this is a linear algorithm because it will never try more than 100,000 combinations. Sorry, constant. Kind of funny meta effect of this is that you could get, you know, very similar UTXOs to reduce that computation that's required, right? That's so. I actually, my what I described in my thesis, which you can find online, I looked at a bunch of different coin selection algorithms, and this was my proposal. And uh, since then, we've made a few small uh, tweaks. One of them is to, to do a look ahead of all the remaining unspends that you find in the subtree. If that doesn't have enough funds, you can throw it away. And if another one is skipping over equivalent solutions, so if you have multiple unspends that are the same size, you frankly don't need to create the same combinations again. So we discover that and skip them. And then the waste metric that I mentioned, which, so in my original proposal, you would always take the first solution you found. So sometimes it was very quick. Now we always run the full combination set, but we pick the best by fitness function. Um, so anyway, we, we looked at the top three leaves. None of those are great. We eventually find 0.09 plus 0.05 combines to 014, and it's a match. And that's where the branch and bound solution finds a perfect input set. So, um, now I'm going to totally change the topic on you and briefly touch on our performance. Um, at uh, BitGo, we use always two or three multisig uh, addresses, and uh, the unfortunate side effect this has is that they're slightly larger than what you're used to. Pay to public key hash at the bottom, 148 bytes for an input, 34 bytes for an output. Um, or, well, there's better ones now with SegWit as well, but this is just a good baseline to, to compare against. So the, the original pay to script hash implementation used, um, this is worst case sizes, so when both the R values are, sorry, yeah, R values are high, then you, you actually have a funny little effect there that is uh, the witness script, sorry, the redeem script uses a var int to describe its length, and up to 254 bytes, it uses uh, one bit. 252. 252, thank you. It's always great to have experts in the audience. Um, and then at, uh, if you have one of the two signatures have a high R value, you actually get 253. And the <laughs> description of the length of the redeem scripts jumps to three bytes. So now suddenly having an, a high R value on only one of the two signature increases the size of your uh, input by three bytes. So the worst case size here is actually four bytes bigger than the best case when you signature burn. But anyway, 297 for pay to script hash inputs. And when we rolled out uh, rapid segwit, we were able to push this down to 140 uh, V bytes then. Uh, output size is the same because they look to everybody the same as just pay to script hash. And native SegWit pushes this down another 25%. Uh, the, the first decrease was almost 53% in size. Second one was 25. But the output is 11 bytes bigger. So um, if it's your, for your change, you're actually paying a little more if it's if it's to somebody else, you can't decide what the address format is anyway, but uh, you still save some 14 or so. Uh, yeah, maybe a little more. Anyway, good savings. What we're really, really excited about is pay to tap root, <laughs> um, because that will allow us to create two or three multisig in the form of a tap root tree where the root encodes the two of two that is most common, which is between BitGo and the hard key of the customer. So there's three keys, obviously, and two or three multisig. Uh, one is the customer hard key, one is the backup key, and the third is the BitGo key. And since we don't have a lot of recoveries, um, it's almost, well, I don't know, 
five nines, six nines of the cases are uh, hot P plus bitgo key. And if we encode that into the root of the type root, it'll look like pay to pub key, which nor, and that's pretty efficient. This is another 44.7% decrease in input size when we get Schnorr. Well, when does the asterisk go away? And the asterisk is recoveries are more expensive. Okay. Because if you have a recovery, you have to reveal if the tap root show that there is a um, the second uh, layer with leaves where the other two two of twos live, and that's uh, I believe 130 roughly bytes, but happens never. Hopefully. <laughs> Oh, that's my question. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, not that often. While we're at it, any more questions? Yes. Uh, I thought the uh, I thought the base tap root case uh, had to be m of m, like three of three or two of two. That is um, not necessarily correct. So with music, you can create input sets of any. Let me see if I get that right. And um, binary monotonic functions, as in any functions you can express with only and and ors, no nots, uh, but you do not get uh, accountability that way. And we really need to know whether we signed or the customer signed or whether it was a recovery. Right? So what we do instead is we partition the two of three into three two of twos, and we put the two of two into the root, and then we know who signed and the two recoveries into the leaves, and we also know who's on it. And all that is still 58 bytes? No, only, only the, the root case is 58. The recovery case would be, I think it adds a pop key and 33 bytes for the taproot reveal, and that makes it... But those are bytes, not V bytes. Bytes, but not V bytes, yes, okay. Um, but roughly uh, 113? Maybe, maybe a little more, maybe there's more over and I, I seem to remember something of 130, but it's still cheaper than wrapped right? Even, so your even the recovery. Is, is the two of two, that's hotkey and big hockey. That's just like the, the snore and then if you need the other, then you... Right, right. The so the, the recovery still looks like a single sick, but you have to reveal the hashing partner, and you have to reveal the, that the original pub key, not, not pub key was a taproot, which I think adds 33 bytes and 32 for the hashing partner. Since uh, Taproot um, proposes to sort the leaves alphabetically, right, Nora? Lexicographically. Lexicographically, okay. And they, you don't have to tell which side of the tree it stands on. Makes it a one byte efficient, more efficient. No So, uh, anyway. My, yeah. More questions? Oh, Can yeah. Go back to the previous slide. Right? How to create a 32 byte P2SH script? Oh, sorry. The the output when you and when you log from you need two, right? Hmm? I mean, is that it includes the amount? Hmm? It includes the amount. Right. Yes. Oh. Sorry. Um, the output adds an amount which is eight bytes, and it adds a. Ah, I see. It's including the amount with it. Yes. Yeah. All right, cool. Then here's a couple BitGo users I brought for you. Um, so that I don't accidentally tell you who this is, I'll call them Sally Descender and Trevor Tradesman. Um, Sally Descender is a send-only hot wallet. I made a little diagram to show you how they set up the wallet. This is two common ways of how people set up hot wallets with us. The warm wallet is in here just to understand what's going on. The warm wallet is not in, important otherwise. We're just looking at the hot wallet. So Sally, the sender, receives deposits into the warm wallet, and it only sends from the hot wallet. On the other side, Trevor, the tradesman, they use a hot wallet that receives and sends, and then whenever they have too much funds in their hot wallet, they deposit into the warm wallet, and vice versa, when the hot wallet runs low, that it gets topped by the warm wallet. Uh, these have roughly similar transaction activity. 
the send only wallet has 1k transactions per day, roughly, mostly sending. Uh, the Trevor wallet has 500 incoming transactions, roughly, and 400 outgoing transactions. So that's about 1.29 inbound TXs. Yes, I know the numbers don't add up, that's on purpose. So, um, we, we made a few little graphs. Um, what you can see here is the purple line is the aggregate value of the wallet. The green line is the unspent count of the wallet. Now, you'll see a few funky little movements in that wallet. One first comment on the purple line, you can very well see the sawtooth pattern, right? So it's top up, send, 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 top up, send, 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 send. And I think that the uh, amounts of the top ups shift because the price of Bitcoin shifted, and probably their value is denominated in uh, Bitcoin, uh, sorry, in, in fiat value that they want to have in their hot wallet, and that's why it's in different spaces. And we also see this funky little place on day 43, where they, I think, accidentally topped up their wallet a little too high and then took out funds right away again, or they had a really big withdrawal. And then you also see this huge slope in the green. Uh, this wallet operator uh, was running on about 500 and something unspent, and they realized that sending only, uh, sorry, they switched to batching, they were a send only with single send before. And when they switched to batching, they needed a lot less unspends because they, they had a regular cadence with which they created transactions. Before that, they sometimes run, ran out of unconfirmed funds. I'm oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Actually, that's on the next slide. So, um, they, they had issues with running out of funds before. And what we suggested to them was batching, which saves them a lot of fees. It created this regular cadence, which made unspent management easier. Uh, we definitely need change splitting on that wallet because every time it gets topped up with a few hundred bitcoins, those might get chopped down into smaller pieces quickly. And um, since almost all of their funds come into the wallet, sorry, all of their UTXOs are created as change, we recommended that they switch to native segment change outputs and suddenly their, their input fees dropped by 25%. <clears throat> Roughly 14% in total because they always send to themselves and the output is bigger. Um, the other wallet that we were looking at is the one that receives and sends from the hot wallet. And you'll notice that the pattern is very different. Um, again, here the green is the count of unspents in the wallet, and the purple is, a, is the total value of the wallet. And so here you see that there's incoming deposits and outgoing uh, withdrawals, and it jumps around a lot more than the very strict sawtooth pattern on the send-only wallet. And I have a question for the audience here. If you look at that first slope uh, at the top of the green and count the, the Little bumps. <laughs> what, what does that make you think of? Business week. Business week. Yeah, it's the business week. So, oh, thank you. Um, so you you see that there is this sequence of five little bumps, nothing. Five little bumps, nothing. This is uh, most definitely the the business week, right? And then uh, you see the slope. Uh, this was actually them switching over to our new coin selection and doing some consolidations on the way. And before that, they had issues with their UTXO pool growth. As you saw, the UTXO pool was naturally always growing in their hot wallet. But after they switched to, to the branch and bound based unspent selection, oh, sorry. what you see is that there's a small slant back downward. So they still have some 20k unspents in their wallet, but they've actually lost, I think, about three and a half thousand in four weeks or so, which I think is uh, pretty optimal. The fun thing that this uh, does is they find 93% transactions without change outputs. 
Yeah, and I, I calculated that roughly per week, that's saving them 0.45 blocks in data. So, yeah, I mean, just not creating fucking change saves them 0.45 blocks of data per week, right? And, um, they, yeah, they reduced the UTXO pool by about 20% in four weeks, and um, by using our waste metric to create larger input sets at low fees and higher input sets at, uh, sorry, minimal input sets at high fees, we see that they just use a few more unspents at low fees, and I've been actually tweaking a little bit there still, so that's maybe still improving, but it's already working, I'd say. Do you have any data on like what transaction space you can achieve with those specific outsets that they have? Like um, so this wallet has, I think, only about 100 inputs that are more than 0.1. They make fairly small transactions, uh, roughly 400 outgoing transactions per day, and um, yeah, 90 percent. Sorry, uh, they they have they had a huge bunch of very very small unspends that basically got ignored by our V1 fee selection due to how it prioritized inputs. And now they're just tapping into that. When you look at a transaction they create, every once in a while there's an unspent at 70 weeks old. And, yeah. and they, they have a very, very good variety in their input set. I, I have not calculated the combination or power set. No. Let's do it. <laughs> we, yeah, to, to make those graphs, we were dumping some, some wallet data. I can't share, obviously. Uh, we might be able to create some interesting graphics. All right, um, so what I have on my long-term to-do list and I find would improve our life a lot is, first of all, replace by fee. Um, the, the situation where we have to guess in advance how much we will have to pay in order to be in the next six blocks or something and then shoot and forget and uh, if there just happens to be a bit of a congestion, we sit there for a week and wait for the transaction or something like that. Or when the fees go really low and we, we're just happily creating transactions at two or three satoshis per byte and then suddenly it picks up again because it's Monday morning. All of these things, of course, you might be partially able to anticipate, but there's so many dimensions to it. The price moving, suddenly Libra having Congress hearings, um, people talking about Bitcoin in public that hadn't commented on it yet, and, and so forth. There's, there's just all these little things that suddenly make transaction volume spike, or and then there's a, maybe a slow block, 45 minutes or something, and bam, you're back at, at 20 Satoshi's per byte or more. So, replace by fee would allow you, as Khaled described at Scaling Bitcoin, I think, is it like two years ago now already? Uh, to amend your fee estimation on the fly, right? Uh, you would block, or you might wait until you reach the block target that you want it to be in, and then keep bumping it into the appropriate range to be included, but you're closing in on the necessary fee from the bottom instead of overshooting at the top. The, there is a bunch of uh, headaches with replace by fee where we do multi-sig and having all parties sign again is sort of arduous. Um, you don't want them to, to have to come back and touch their transactions again. So you could perhaps create a set in advance of like all the possible intervals that you might want to bump the transaction to. But then you get into trouble, for example, when somebody builds on top of your replace by fee transaction, you have to pay for the, the child transaction too in order to replace your replace by fee. And then the next problem is everybody is so used to tracking transactions by TX ID. When you suddenly start um, changing TX, TX IDs on a regular basis, everybody will be hella confused. And um, so yeah, uh, there, there are a few design considerations going into this, but we could definitely save a shit ton of fees, and we could 
You can whip that out, right? <laughs> All right. Um, we could save vast amounts of fees, and we could um, make this whole self-sustaining fee ceilings go away. If you watch the mempool a while, you'll see that very often you have a lingering 100 satoshi per byte fee, fee bottom, just because everybody keeps adding transactions at that fee rate, and then it just comes back all the time and never goes away. Even though in between, transactions of five satoshis per byte are, are confirming because the blocks are basically empty. But on top, there's still a set of 100. And then there's a slow block, and everybody's back at 100. And this, this lingering after effect of, of a fee bottom, um, or fee ceiling, that everybody tries to overshoot, and that would go away if a lot of people started using RBF. And then there's, of course, other problems like um, some big Bitcoin company is still believing that this is uh, the end of everything and advocating against it. Some wallets, um, some, some big block explorers still not showing RBF on their transactions and confusing people into accepting zero conf RBF transactions and losing a lot of money. Um, you know, the, the that, usual. That was subtle. Big block explorers. Mm. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> big block explorers. Um, yeah, I, I, I think they're focusing on other coins these days. Um, but anyway, the so RBF would be great. Not sure how we'll get it yet. Uh, definitely excited about Taproot. Already explained why, and I think that we can still do better with uh, doing managing amount variance in wallets. And one thing that I've been thinking about a little bit is, is it perhaps even possible to create change and spend that span magnitudes and save money that way? Even though you're first creating more outputs than you'd ever think you, you'd need, you, you might be able to create more branch and bound solutions in the long run and, and save funds that way. Um, especially on, for example, a send only wallet, you tend to only have fairly big pieces because the change that you get back, we, we don't let that get too small. Otherwise, if fees rise, they might not be able to spend those, those unspent. But if you perhaps um, make that a little more lenient, create smaller pieces as well, they might actually find more branch and bound solutions on, on a send-only wallet. The, the send-only wallet had only 0.2% branch and bound solutions uh, in comparison to the 93. Uh, for reference. All right, um, that was a long talk, sorry, but um, what I would like you to do is rethink your time preference. Does your transaction really need to be in the next block? Uh, I, I bought myself an item on the internet a while ago that was fairly expensive, paid with Bitcoin, and I got a invoice and it said, pay in the next 24 hours, and I was like, all right, five Satoshi's provided it. Um, that, that, I mean, that especially applies for consolidations, but also for other business um, re, um, business transactions. Like um, one of our customers, for example, sends transactions that they only expect to be confirmed by next midday. Well, in the night it usually clears, so maybe make that not a five block target, but a sixty block target. Um, that should go through most days, and if not you might be able to see PFP it in the morning. Or, yeah, just just think how quickly do you need that transaction. Adopting protocol updates is pretty uh, useful. We, when we rolled out wrapped SegWit, we were a little dismayed at the low uptake of it, and we started collecting stats on some wallets, and we sent that email to one of our customers, hey, uh, we calculated if all of your inputs had been Wrapped SegWit instead of pay to script hash, you would have saved $60,000 this week, uh, sorry, this month. And they said, we'll get on it early next week. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then I, I think as the graph showed, uh, the mempool graph that I showed very early on, we are seeing a little more fee spikes in, in the uh, mempool in the past three months. We had spikes up to 50 megabytes. Um, I think it's it's a good idea to just be aware of it, um, start consolidating and or bringing your wallet in shape. 
adopting native SegWit or wrapped SegWit, at least if you feel that you cannot rely on everybody being able to send native SegWit addresses here. And, well, just prepare. Cool. More questions? Uh, do you think that there's, it would, it would, I guess I'll, I'll say, it, it would seem to be like there would be a strategy of having your, your signing time being adjusted if you can, if you have like the human resources to do it. Meaning like, instead of signing transactions at 8 a.m. on Monday, you know, sign it in the dead of night or where, you know, where we see cyclical holes. Is that, a, you think, a rational strategy or well, for, for the time, time preference? Let me turn that a little bit around. I find it kind of weird when you push in multiple megabytes of transactions at 6 a.m. every morning. That does not seem very efficient. Uh, there, um, or maybe, maybe, maybe to modify it, do you see enough transaction volume that could shift to lulls that it's warranted? Yeah, um, I mean, I, lo I looked at them. The, today was pretty full, the, the block. Uh, the blocks run it, I mean. But before the talk started, there had been 19 blocks that had space. So, yes, there, there's room to shift a little bit. I think there, it's being used pretty pretty well these days, where we have a lot of blocks that are full. Um, also, if people start shifting around, it might actually cause people to, to call less on shelling points and uh, make trouble for each other. But, um, like, if everybody just stopped doing two-block target and six-block target, I think that would smooth things out vastly already. Yes. So let's continue on the previous question. So, uh, if I want to send my transaction at a time where it's really low, can I, but I don't want to wait until that moment to generate a transaction, can I just pre-sign my transaction and use like a time lock and yeah. to time the... Well, either you could use a time lock, but that would not necessarily help you because um, if you lock it to a block in the future, it'll just not be able to go into a previous block. But what you could do is you could get a signed transaction and then, for example, only submit it when the mempool is low enough that it would go through. Um, I mean, the, once the transaction is signed, it's immutable. And you, you'd have to create another transaction in order to change it. And uh, if you have to sign transaction, you can just keep it around as long as you want and just a cron job can check the, the mempool level and, and uh, send it off. Hi. No? I mean, on the other hand, you could just submit it and wait and if there's a, uh, a few fast blocks, it'll maybe just get through. Yeah, I don't think there's any advantage in waiting if you have the transaction to send it. Yeah. Right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if it got that kicked out by the mempool, you would have sent it anyway, it's sent it again. Right, or, or you can double spend it at that point, easier. Right. Alex? So, it seems like your company's way ahead <laughs> to other folks about um, unspent selection. Have you thought about a, a public service or like a paid service where you just run some endpoint and all these different companies use it and because we're all using the same selection algorithm and we have like global knowledge we can decrease block space and all the all the juicy things well i'm aware of one company working on something kind of similar to that um, they they want to basically provide a service where they would get paid on lightning to send on-chain transactions which they would batch um, I don't think that you'd want somebody else to do your unspent selection for you, because then you have to tell them all of your unspents, which is a bit of a privacy red flag. Is there a way around that? Um, I mean, you can run the software on your side with your unspents, but then well, just run whatever software. They, then they provide wallet software to you. Then you have to vet their software and You can anonymize the unspent. You can just trivial the number of confirmations and value, and maybe type, but not the exact ID. So that way. True, you could do that. But if I know the exact value. <laughs> you can oh. pass the value. Slightly, okay. Yeah. 
Also, how do they then later know which ones to actually pick? Yeah, you're gonna have to like figure out how surprising or entropic like the amounts. Uh, isn't there? I don't. I don't know. Isn't there a model that you could use with liquid where you can essentially have like a common? You can basically like have a collective hot wallet. You could have like a instead of every single independent agent running their own hot wallet, you can use liquid to have a single, you know, say mega hardened hot wallet, and then people redeem through that that hot wallet. Isn't that a potential solution for what he's proposing? Or yeah, I mean, you, you, you could you could, for example, um, so we we already know about dance pens of all of our customers, for example. We could maybe in the long term start offering a service where we would build multi-party transactions for them, right? But the, the efficiency gain for that would be not that high. What you save is only the transaction headers um, because they still have their own inputs and they're creating their own outputs and none of the change gets, gets shared in any way. Um, Turns out that regulated entities don't necessarily care, care as much about privacy as, as individuals. So the multi-party transactions are not that attractive for them. It might be interesting when people start looking more at chain analysis for, for like business espionage, I guess, or like market movements. Oh, somebody deposited a lot of money into whatever, Bitstamp. Then, then it might be more interesting to slightly hide what wallet directly funds came from, but right now we've, this is not not something that I perceive as much sought after. Alex. I heard some crazy stuff on the internet where we can combine signatures from different transactions and then we just have, but like just using Bitcoin. Yeah. One, one mega transaction with just one input Thousands of outputs. Um, Is that a thing? Maybe. Are you talking about cross input signature aggregation? Because that still has the reference which you took so you're spending and is not currently a proposed bit. bit. Um, you could do something that like you took so switching, swapping. And uh, that's been proposed, I think, a few years ago as a bit where you would basically send a transaction for somebody else if they also send a transaction for you. Kind of like transfer-wise on, on the blockchain. Right? Um, that disintermediates the unspent from the sender, but I mean, that doesn't really change the blockchain footprint or chain. Like, they might still be able, well, yeah, I, I sent this thing for, for that other party. They might not know who you are. No, no, they're they're basically getting your heat. So, not sure how attractive that would be. I, I I'm not sure how you would combine transactions in order to to collect multiple inputs unless you had, for example, a lightning construction where multiple people lock funds, and only if all of them pay into it, you create a, an on-chain transaction that is um, encumbered with. Uh, like signatures from all of the, yeah, you could, I guess you could do that. You could um, stage a transaction that is in an address encumbered by all the participants of a multi-send and they pay you on lightning and only if all the lightning payments go through the encumbered input would get sent. But I think that's pretty far out there. <laughs> Anybody doing anything cool with uh, fee estimation, just like in general? Like, is there anything like unique somebody people are doing? I, I think it would be a great idea if somebody started looking more at that. I can. I am currently not aware of any extraordinary efforts. I mean, there's what the fee I owe, um, which gives you a little more um, overview in making it multi-dimensional. Like, what block do you want to be in and with what um, um, certainty? But, um, yeah, 
I, th I think the, the best way to go forward with fee estimation is for us to work on RBF, because then we can can signal time preference on an um, updated schedule and just get the best price. Hello. Uh, do you have uh, any clue if like the miners like they care the transaction size, or the only thing they are looking for is like the fee rate itself? So like if I have like a transaction with like thousand outputs or something like that, like does it is it like beneficial to split it into like smaller batches? Um, as far as I know, the miners only just go down the fee rate and pick whatever fits, and then. If your transaction is too big and it's at the bottom end of the block, it might not get in because it doesn't fit anymore. So that might be a small advantage to make multiple chunks, but other than that, um, I think whatever pays the highest fee rate just goes in uh, greedy. Um, yep. So very large transactions can, can actually have a bit of a disadvantage just by not fitting and getting skipped in an inclusion. Yes? So you talk about um, how in a uh, two or three Schnorr scheme where you only have like six leaves in your taproot vertical tree, uh, does the size of your Schnorr signature uh, grow with the number of leaves that you have or does it stay constant? Um, well, for the taproot, if you spend it, it stays constant because it looks like a single thing. But if you reveal, so you can only uh, have other scripts in the leaves the, the tree. So if you have six leaves, you need a tree that is um, more than one level, two, three levels probably, yeah, three levels. And um, so you would have to reveal uh, that it is a taproot for the three bytes, uh, first level hashing partner, second level hashing partner, and then uh, the actual pub key of the third. So yes, uh, if you have to reveal the, the tree, and it has multiple levels, you have to reveal more. Um, but if you spend the taproot, you don't. And the more signature combinations you have, the more levels that you, you could get, right? Um, you mean in an example with... Um, we well, have like, it's like 10 out of 20. Oh yeah, and you want that accountable? Yeah, that, that would just make it rather deep. In that case, you might want to just make the top then 20 of 20 or something. And as long as people agree, um, they can send it wherever. But, yeah. um, that's a bit of an efficiency problem. You, you might, well, if we get graft root after we, we get bipchnor and bip tap root and whatever else we all need before graft root, graft root allows delegation that would be more efficient actually at that point. Because, um, uh, so what graft root does is it allows you to add other ways to spend an output after the output was created by delegating to a party, or sorry, the, the creators of that, uh, or the, the owners of that output can delegate more spending patterns. And um, that has, I think, a redirection of 16 bytes plus 32 bytes for the new pub key, so just 32, yeah. Anyway, um, if you go multi-level, graft root is probably cheaper. But two years, three years, five years, who knows? Okay. I think I think those are all the questions that are going to be asked.